Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. In the early morning hours of October 18th, 2009, authorities in the French city of Mulhouse received a call that sent them racing. Just four blocks away from a local police station, down a narrow residential street, a 74-year-old German man had been badly beaten and appeared to be lying immobilized at the side of the road. When officers arrived at the scene, they found the elderly man as described. He was curled up helplessly on the pavement, having been both gagged and tied up. He had sustained a number of injuries consistent with a brutal assault, but would survive. The man told police that several hours earlier he had been the victim of a violent kidnapping at his home in Scheidegg, Germany, a town in the south of the country near the border of Austria. He said that three assailants had punched him in the face, restrained him, and had thrown him into their vehicle before finally abandoning him where he was found. Just one day later, investigators were able to track down the person responsible for the kidnapping. The suspect was another man in his 70s who had been tracked to a hotel in Mulhouse thanks to cell phone data. When police went to the man's hotel room, they found him there extremely calm and collected. He did not resist, nor did he deny his involvement in the kidnapping. Though initially perplexed, investigators would soon learn the reason behind the suspect's mysterious demeanor. It would turn out that this was a moment nearly 30 years in the making. Before we get to the main part of today's story, if you find our videos interesting and informative, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Alright, with that out of the way, let's get to the video. In the early 1970s, it seemed that Andre Bamberski had everything he could possibly want out of life. He had a good job, was happily married to his wife Danielle, and was the proud father of two children, a daughter named Kalinka and a son named Nicholas. This harmonious existence was in stark contrast to how Andre had grown up. Born in the late 1930s to Polish parents who had immigrated to France, as a child, Andre lived through the horrors of the Second World War. While staying with his grandparents in Poland, Andre was taken from his family by German soldiers during the invasion of 1939. He wasn't reunited with his parents until the end of the war, six years later. After returning to France, Andre had received the rest of his education, discovering he had a talent for mathematics. Because of his methodical nature, his knack for organization, and his excellent memory, he decided to become a chartered accountant. After receiving his qualifications, he decided to move to the Moroccan city of Casablanca, where he met his wife Danielle, and the two started a family. Life was good for the family in Morocco, but in 1974 they decided that they would start a new adventure, picking up and moving back to France. They settled in a town on the outskirts of the city of Toulouse, in the country's south. Unfortunately for Andre, the move to France would be far from the biggest change to happen to his family, as barely a year after the move, his marriage would fall apart. Danielle was having an affair with a German cardiologist named Dieter Krombach. Dieter was not a stranger to Andre. In fact, he had lived four houses down from them in Casablanca. He had worked at the German consulate as one of the doctors there. Danielle and Dieter's affair had started in Morocco and had continued once the Bambersky family had moved back to France. When the family arrived, Dieter rented an apartment in Toulouse where he continued to meet up with Danielle regularly. When Andre found out about the affair, his wife was reportedly less than apologetic. Instead, she announced that she was leaving Andre and the family and would be moving to Germany with Dieter. Andre and Danielle divorced and she and Dieter married in 1977. In the five years after being painfully abandoned by his wife, Andre did his best to raise his kids, Kalinka and Nicholas, more or less on his own. However, life as a single parent was expensive, and by 1980, he decided it would be best for them to move back to Morocco for a better quality of life. Sadly for Andre, this decision would horribly backfire, 
as when Danielle got word of his plans, she filed a legal complaint against him. The resulting proceedings ended with her getting primary custody of both of the children, who would move to live with their mother and Dieter in the German town of Lindau. Determined not to be cut out of his children's lives, André decided not to move to Morocco, and instead stayed in France where he could at least see Kalinka and Nicholas during school vacations. This strategy seemed to work, as the children were reportedly not fond of living in Germany, and two years after the move, it was decided that they would once again be allowed to return to live with André. They would spend one final summer with Danielle and Dieter before heading back to France. However, before this could happen, a horrifying tragedy would strike, one that would forever change the course of André's life. On Saturday, July 10th, 1982, André received a phone call from his ex-wife that shattered his world. Their 14-year-old daughter, Kalinka, was dead. Understandably, initially André was unable to process the news. It made no sense, he thought. His daughter had been a healthy, athletic teenager with no serious medical problems to speak of. He demanded that Danielle tell him what happened. Danielle explained that she was just as mystified as he was. The previous day, Kalinka had seemed fine. She had spent the day windsurfing on Lake Constance in southern Germany, and had returned home late in the afternoon. That evening after dinner, she had been feeling a bit unwell, so had gone to bed early, and had last been checked on later that night by Dieter, who had given her a pill to help her sleep. The next morning, Dieter had also been the one to discover Kalinka dead. He had frantically given her a number of injections in an attempt to revive her, but it was too late. Kalinka had clearly been dead for several hours. Initially, André did not suspect any foul play. An autopsy was held a couple of days after his daughter's death, but the family was told that this was merely a formality, mostly because of the sudden nature of Kalinka's death. Overcome with grief, André spent the next several weeks going through the motions, arranging a funeral for his daughter back in France, where she was laid to rest. At the time, he had no suspicions that anything sinister had happened. It wasn't until three months later, in October of 1982, that André's attitude towards the case began to change, when he finally received a copy of Kalinka's autopsy report. The document was bizarre, not just because of what it included, but what it seemed to leave out. Firstly, the autopsy never reached a definitive conclusion about Kalinka's death. This was despite the fact that food particles were found in her lungs and esophagus, something that later experts would state suggested that she could have asphyxiated while vomiting. Then there were the injection marks, which were in numerous places on Kalinka's body. Though Dieter had explained that he had used several drugs to try and revive her, again, later experts would argue that the cocktail of substances he claimed to have given her made no sense. Most suspicious of all of these injections was one of iron cobalt. Unlike the other injections, this had reportedly not been administered to save Kalinka's life. Dieter said that he had given the teenager the injection around dinner time on the night of her death, something he apparently routinely did for friends and family to help with tanning. However, while speaking with police, Dieter changed his story, saying that he had instead given Kalinka the iron cobalt injection because she was anemic. While iron cobalt can apparently be used to treat anemia, according to information we could find, it's generally used as a last resort for people who can't take iron supplements orally. The reason for this is because the injections can cause adverse reactions, including anaphylactic shock in people with allergies. The whole thing was made all the more bizarre, considering that Kalinka had no documented history of suffering from anemia. Despite all of this, the autopsy report stated that the medical examiners had not conducted a toxicology report on Kalinka. This is where red flags really started to go off for Andre, as this seemed to make no sense. However, the most jarring information in the entire autopsy report came during the description of the examination for signs of sexual assault. The report noted that there were apparent injuries to Kalinka's genitals, and that a quote, whitish substance was found in the area, though this had shockingly never been followed up on. Despite all of these bizarre details, Kalinka's cause of death was listed as unknown, 
and the case was closed before Andre had even received a copy of the autopsy report. As Andre struggled to come to terms with the mysterious report, he began to feel more and more like it wasn't adding up. He had already started to believe that his daughter might have been murdered when, for him, the last piece of the puzzle fell into place. It turned out that Dieter Kronbach had been present at Kalinka's autopsy. German authorities would say that Dieter hadn't been physically allowed in the room, but still, to Andre, it felt like a cover-up. He was sure that Dieter had violated and murdered his daughter, and that because of the respect people had for him as a doctor, they were either helping him to get away with the crime, or were believing his stories at face value and choosing to ignore the suspicious circumstances. Andre had hoped that at the very least, his ex-wife, Kalinka's mother, would agree that things needed to be investigated. Incredulously, she accused Andre of holding a grudge against Dieter, and according to Andre, said that Kalinka had died, quote, because it was her time to die. When Andre appealed to German authorities to reopen the investigation into his daughter's death, they declined to do so. Not knowing where else to turn, Andre hired a well-known German lawyer named Rolf Bossi to fight his case and put pressure on authorities in the country. Initially, it seemed like this had worked, as in early 1983, a review of the autopsy was ordered. The review led to several more disturbing findings that called Dieter Kronbach's actions into question. Among the biggest of these was that based on Kalinka's stomach contents at the time of her initial autopsy, it was clear that Dieter had lied about the timing of her death. A significant amount of undigested food was found to be in the teenager's stomach at the time of her death, suggesting that she had died hours earlier than Dieter had said. In addition to this, authorities further scrutinized his decision to inject Kalinka with iron cobalt, saying that it was dangerous and unnecessary. One French expert would say that the injection could have caused an allergic reaction that led to her death, which, if she had asphyxiated, would have explained the food particles in her lungs and esophagus. However, the German doctors in charge of the autopsy review stopped short of this conclusion, ultimately declining to provide a definitive cause of death for a second time. The idea of a possible sexual assault was likewise left inconclusive, though part of this was supposedly to do with the fact that German authorities ignored the review team's requests for certain evidence. As a result of the inconclusive findings, a German prosecutor declared that there wasn't enough evidence to proceed with a case against Dieter, and with that, legal proceedings came to a screeching halt. With no legal recourse seemingly left to him, but nevertheless convinced of Dieter's guilt, Andre decided that if he couldn't change the minds of German authorities, he would instead try to change the minds of the German public. In September of 1983, he traveled to the town where Dieter lived, and began to pass out flyers to local residents. The flyers accused Dieter of being a murderer and gave his name and address. They also claimed he was being protected by powerful local officials in the town. Andre was arrested within two hours of passing out the flyers. After the stunt, Dieter sued Andre for defamation, ultimately winning and being awarded 500,000 Deutschmarks, or roughly $273,000 US. Andre went back to France and apparently was able to avoid paying. Despite being threatened with six months prison time if he repeated his actions, he reportedly sent out the flyers again to town residents once back in France, this time by mail. After seemingly hitting nothing but dead ends in Germany, Andre decided to try a new approach and began trying to get a legal case against Dieter Kronbach going in France instead. Though this took some time, Andre was met with less resistance, and in 1985, French authorities exhumed Kalinka's body for testing. What they discovered was unbelievable. It's important to note that sources contradict each other on this next bit, with some saying that Kalinka's organs were missing, and others stating that her entire genital area was missing. But what we do know is that whatever the exact case was, it made testing for sexual assault impossible. Again. German authorities denied any wrongdoing, claiming that all of the teenager's remains had been returned after the conclusion of her autopsy. Unfortunately, exactly what happened to Kalinka's partially missing remains would never be definitively solved. 
though I'm sure you can imagine that it made Andre all the more suspicious of his theories of a cover-up. That being said, in the years since, many have attributed these same events not to malice, but to sloppy police work and profound negligence on the part of German authorities. While this might have been the point at which even the most determined people gave up, Andre persisted, and over the next several years continued to build a case against Dieter Kronbach. In 1988, he had his first real success when a French forensics expert definitively concluded that the iron cobalt shot had been the cause of Kalinka's death, though once again, this did not convince German officials. Finally, in 1993, 11 years after Kalinka's death, Andre succeeded in getting his daughter's case brought before a French court, and Dieter Kronbach was charged with voluntary homicide. The proceedings ended two years later, with Dieter being convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Though this was a huge step, the victory was largely symbolic, as Dieter refused to attend the proceedings and German authorities refused to extradite him, meaning he was convicted in absentia. Even this victory was short-lived, though, as in 2001, the European Court of Human Rights threw out the French verdict, saying that the country had been wrong to conduct a trial without the suspect able to defend himself. French officials were even forced to pay out compensation to Dieter over the situation, a sum of 100,000 francs. However, even though Dieter appeared to be winning at every turn, during this time, his life of crime was finally beginning to catch up with him. You see, it turned out that Kalinka Bambersky was not the doctor's only victim. In 1997, Dieter admitted to drugging and violating a 16-year-old patient in his medical office. She was one of several victims to come forward, but the only one for whom police could find sufficient evidence to take the case to court. Dieter lost his medical license as a result of being found guilty, but ridiculously was only given a two-year suspended sentence mostly to do with his good reputation and prestige within the community. Seemingly unable to continue pressing his luck, Dieter was arrested again in 2006, when it was discovered that he had continued to practice medicine without a license. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison, and this time would serve the sentence, being released in 2008. Between the time that the murder charge against Dieter was thrown out and the time of his release from jail in 2008, Andre had continued to work tirelessly on his daughter's case. By 1999, he had quit his job to work on Dieter's pursuit and capture full-time, sparing no expense and spending countless amounts of money. At times, even his closest friends and family members told him to abandon the fight, saying that it wasn't doing any good. Andre said that he didn't care what it took. He wasn't stopping, because he had made a promise to himself and his daughter that he would get justice. In fact, he frequently traveled to Germany to tell Dieter this to his face, that he wasn't going to stop harassing him until he paid for what he had done. However, partly as a result of this, and partly because of his newfound status as a convicted criminal, Dieter began to move around Germany constantly, and his movements became harder to track. In 2009, Andre learned through contacts of his that Dieter was living in the town of Scheidek, just west of Lindau. However, word was that he was about to move again, this time possibly to West Africa. Andre knew that if Dieter managed to successfully flee the country, he might never find him again. The clock was also ticking in a second, arguably more pressing way as well. In 2012, it would be 30 years since Kalinka's death and under French law, this was the statute of limitations for the case. Andre needed to get Dieter to France, where a warrant was still out for his arrest, but all legal and diplomatic channels had failed. He decided it was time for drastic action. He would make Dieter come to France, one way or another. In the fall of 2009, Andre met with a man named Anton Krasniki, an immigrant from Kosovo living in Austria. Anton said that he could help Andre with his problem. Sources we came across contradict each other about what happened next, with some saying that Anton asked for 20,000 euros to cover expenses, while others state that Andre had to force him to take the money. What we do know is that Anton agreed to kidnap Dieter Kronbach and bring him to France, saying that he was doing it for humanitarian reasons. 
so it was, that late on the night of October 17th, 2009, Dieter Krombach, now 74 years old, was attacked and restrained outside of his home in Germany, thrown into a car, and driven west to the French town of Meluse. That same night, Andre received a call from the kidnappers telling him to travel to the city, where he would place a call to local authorities after receiving confirmation that Dieter had been dumped near a police station. Andre did as he was told, attempting to disguise his voice, but as previously mentioned, it didn't take long for investigators to figure out what had happened. Not only were police able to trace this call to his cell phone, but Anton reportedly somehow managed to accidentally leave a piece of paper outside of Dieter's home with his name, address, and phone number on it. Though Andre was arrested, it didn't matter to him. The plan had worked. Dieter was now in French custody. In October of 2011, Dieter Krombach was convicted for causing intentional bodily harm resulting in unintentional death in connection with Kalinka Bamberski's case. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. The verdict was appealed, but was upheld at least three times in 2012, 2014, and 2018. In early 2020, Dieter was released from prison for health reasons. He died at an old age home in Germany just months after being released. Before we leave behind Dieter Krombach for good, it should be said that there's decent evidence that he was even more evil than what we were able to cover just within the confines of this video. Some believe that he also murdered his first wife, and there were reports that he assaulted many, many more women. Some sources we came across state that he was able to get away with these crimes unnoticed for so long by drugging his wives while taking advantage of victims in his home. As for Andre Bamberski, he fully owned up to the kidnapping plot and was more than willing to face the consequences. However, it seems that after more than 30 years, the grieving father was finally able to catch a break and was handed a one-year suspended jail sentence. If you can believe it, after everything that happened, German authorities reportedly had the gall to demand that France hand over Andre following the kidnapping. As you might imagine, France declined. While Andre Bamberski's fight for justice lasted so much longer than it ever should have needed to, if you ask us, the case is a powerful testament to his love for his daughter. Sadly, we could not find any information about where Andre is today, but we hope that wherever he is, he has found peace. Now that you've heard the whole story though, what do you think? Is there anything you think we missed or left out? Let us know in the comments section below. While you're there, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our future releases. And as always, thank you for watching.